the Beijing. A uh, warm welcome to join ICAX Talks every Friday like this. We have this ICAX Talk. I think it's quite amazing. Uh, last week, we everyone knows that we celebrated for the 100 weeks. Yeah, we have our ICAX Talks every Friday for 100 weeks. So it's amazing. These talks, we invited the top scientists worldwide and to celebrate uh for the you know science and technology the latest results and the so uh connect world and universe get all the people to listen to all this latest work and uh, this was a long time story and uh, now i'm proud to tell everyone that we have this 100 versions we have more than uh, two, uh, uh 24 uh, uh 240 million people online watching all this so it was quite a uh, good numbers and everything was uh amazing i see i can actually really give uh, everyone a lot of feelings but uh, no matter how these were, uh, numbers looks good. No matter how many stories was, uh, you know, get on this stage. Now today is a new day. Yeah, I think you know we move on for the next hundred or next thousand. So today is our the first talk and the one hundred one. So of course you see who will be this lucky person to deliver the talks yeah we have a bunch of lucky group here so we have the speakers it was from university of uh, texas austin and uh, we have our panelists uh, professor nicholas george and Zehua. so today uh, is my great honor to get uh, my best friends and uh, our guest uh, our best friends uh, i can ask professor nicholas peppers to introduce our new speakers the number one speakers at this session okay so professor nicholas are you ready i am ready okay. thank you very much alice thank you very much to everybody i'm delighted to be introducing the 101st a speaker of this great series, the Icon X, a series that has taught us many, many, many things about biology, molecular biology, cell biology, uh, engineering, chemistry, and so on. And I am particularly delighted today to introduce one of the leaders of the field of metabolic engineering worldwide, and that is Professor Hal Alper who is from the Department of Chemical Engineering of the University of Texas at Austin. He holds the uh, Les and Sherry Stoyer Endowed Professorship, and he is at the same time the Executive Director of the Center for Biomedical Research Support of the University. Hal Alper did his uh, undergraduate studies at the University of Maryland, in the late 1990s and early 2000, and then got his PhD from with the famous professor Gregory Stephanopoulos at MIT. During that time, he developed a series of new processes and models that have become a standard in our field. Immediately after that, he went to the Whitehead Institute, again in Boston, and he was a postdoctoral fellow and also at the Shire Human uh, Genetic Therapies Institute. And then after that, he arrived at the University of Texas, where in the last 14, 15, 16 years, he has become, of course, full professor, distinguished professor, but he has led a tremendous effort in the field, which has been translated into a number of earth-shaking contributions that you read now in journals like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Nature and the various subsidiaries of Nature, Science, and so on. Uh, Hal is an exciting figure in the field. Those of you who are attending for the first time a talk in metabolic engineering, you're going to be surprised really with what can be done in that particular field. Many of us hear the words metabolic engineering, synthetic biology, and of course, sustainability. And we don't really understand what these words mean. We cannot really identify them exactly as scientific subjects. So here you are, you have a leader who will introduce you to that. 
Two more things. He has received a very large number of awards. Very impressive that at his young age, he is a member of the National Academy of Inventors of the United States. He is, of course, a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineers. He has received many awards in the biomedical, biological, and chemical engineering fields, including the Danny, Danny Wang Award, which is very prestigious, an early Camille and Henry Dreyfus uh, Teacher Scholar Award, the Society of Industrial Microbiology Award, the Young Investigator Award, from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Alan P. Colburn Award, which is an indication, and I know I'm going to embarrass him now, an indication that National Academy of Engineering will be coming in the next uh, five years, because almost everybody who got the Colburn Award eventually ended in the National Academy. I am delighted to introduce him to you. I know he will give us a great talk. Those of you who follow the literature very well, you may have seen the incredible response of the public to their latest paper in which they discover enzymatic ways by which they can break down polyethylene terephthalate, the PTAS, A-S-E, I don't know how to pronounce it. And basically with this, hopefully we will have a new way of treating plastics and truly biodegrading them. I want also to thank my two colleagues who will be participating today, Professor George Guachang, who is a distinguished professor at Tsinghua University, and Ms. Zhang, who is a PhD student at Peking University, who will be the panelists and they will ask the difficult questions. I want to close with one statement. Hal has been in uh, China many times, in, especially at Tsinghua University, but also elsewhere. Uh, I believe he is a visiting, he was an honorary professor in one of those universities. And uh, again, it is my delight to introduce him. Hal, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that great introduction. Um, it's very, very touching to highlight a couple of our things and um, very appreciative of both the introduction as well as the nomination to be able to be the first in the next in this first set set after the first set of 100 um, talks here and obviously thanks to Alice and all of her great organization for uh, creating this series as well as sustaining it through to kind of churning over the the number to 100 and will hopefully as she said continue to a thousand onward so um, as was just demonstrated from the introduction, I have a couple of different topics. So we just heard about the topic of metabolic engineering, of synthetic biology, of sustainability, and trying to figure out how we can really harness the power of biology to solve a lot of the grand challenges that we have. And in this talk, mostly concerned with the ability to make renewable types of chemicals to deal with various different waste streams. And I'll end on that high note that, um, that Nicholas had just introduced on the ability to even take things like plastic waste, which is an extraordinary environmental challenge, and convert that into an opportunity for sustained chemical type production. So to give you a little bit of a, of a concept, what, we, what I'm thinking in my mind when I think about sustainability, and that is the fact that we need to transition away from just traditional chemical manufacturing. We need to find new ways to make the molecules that we want, be it either a sophisticated therapeutic protein or a small molecule or a fuel or a food. We're really seeing this infiltration of how biology can change the way in which we make things. But traditionally, especially coming in a chemical engineering background, we, we think about this. We think about barrels of oil going into a large chemical process plant or refinery. And from there, you've seen countless pictures of how this barrel of oil can be fractionated into various different streams to give us everything that we do and use and um, like on a day-to-day -day basis. And certainly the fuels, to our plastics, to our materials, to our chemicals, to a lot of our pharmaceuticals, there's a footprint of petroleum or petroleum derived products in the vast majority of these day-to-day -day type chemicals and entities. 
So as we think about sustainability, we're drilling this out of the ground and then creating things that exist that then get dumped into trash piles. And then we repeat that process over again. We don't, sometimes there's some recycling that goes in the middle, but generally speaking, this is new carbon that's being put into a un, uh, unclosed loop type of system. Now, instead, what happens if we could grow these materials? And this was really the impetus be behind a lot of the lignocellulosic biomass utilization efforts in the past 20 or 30 years, trying to think of this idea of how do we take originally the easy to use things like corn or various different types of oils and convert those more directly using microbes, bacterial systems, fungal systems, various different types of organisms of interest and convert that into these various different chemicals and materials. Then we realized, okay, food sources maybe aren't the most sustainable method either. We're competing between making our products and eating food. We can move to the harder to use biomass sources. We can do the leftovers of plants. So things like lignocellulosic hydrolysates, thinking of materials like corn stover or forestry materials or leftover uh, materials from various different agricultural processes. But I'd say, let's think that further. What if beyond that, we can take end of life and turn that back into a feedstock? Can we create a perfectly closed loop type process where when we're done with these materials, they can be broken back down, utilized for the carbon that they contain and reconverted back either into itself again in a fresh form or into something else that could be usable. So this is really this degrees of sustainability, moving away from traditional processing to one in which we can use renewable resources to produce those, and then to one where we can actually recycle in a chemical sense the carbon that we've already put into these processes. In a way, we're desiring us to make a factory that can make uh, any chemical of our choosing. And then this, again, is a very strong premise from the idea of chemical engineering, being able to take a variety of inputs, ideally the cheapest things possible, right? whether it's petroleum resources to chemical waste, agricultural byproducts, non-conventional carbon. We're looking at trying to find ways to put these into traditional refineries and chemical processing plants and produce what we use, produce what we want and desire from pharmaceuticals to chemicals to materials, uh, even inorganic materials. And this is the, the general chemical engineering paradigm of input and output there. And when we have done that, and the premise of the field has been to build modular, flexible platforms, the idea of having unit operations, the idea of being able to diversify the inputs and outputs that is possible through expanding amounts of chemical catalysis. And so this is a paradigm that has definitely driven the chemical industry. But at the same time, what if this factory were biologically based instead? What if we could use biology to not just can do these conversions, but rather also access chemistries that are inaccessible or very difficult to access through traditional chemical means? So we can use biology in a very flexible and modular fashion. And I'll showcase ways in which we can actually use the principles of metabolic engineering synthetic biology to build modular biocatalysts. We can use that biology to vary the types of inputs and outputs that we can produce. And as I mentioned, we can expand beyond what is possible, not just within chemical catalysis, but creating new to biology chemistry to access new types of products. So really that's where our story picks up within our lab. And uh, in the past, I think it's only been 13 years, so not, not as old as um, it was mentioned in the introduction, um, we have been able to, to work on a variety of different applications of how do we engineer cells? The idea of going from synthetic biology, how do we create synthetic parts? How do we modify the DNA? to encode it and endow it with the properties and traits that we want. How do we use directed evolution? And, and certainly this is a, a really large topic um, that has been um, really 
attention has shown onto it, especially in the recent Nobel Prize that has been awarded in directed evolution, the idea that you can take a starting point that may be suboptimal for your application and go through iterative rounds of diversification and selection to be able to get the desired function. We can showcase how we can do that on the small protein level all the way up to an entire cell or even a population. And then likewise, the ability to engineer pathways. These are the traditional chemical synthesis pathways, if you think about it, except they happen within a cell. So we don't have the luxury of being able to vastly change temperature and pressure as you would with a chemical system. Instead, we need to genetically encode modifications to be able to create the biases of pathways that we desire. And when we're successful with all these, so we develop a lot of these various different tool sets, we can create novel diversified products and phenotypes. And this is kind of the ones I'll talk about throughout the course of this talk today. So really utilizing the tools of metabolic engineering and synthetic biology, we can solve a lot of these sustainability problems. So we mainly focus on fungal systems, so different types of yeast systems and engineering of proteins. And as I'll showcase in this talk, we can create novel diversified product, products that can span everything from biofuels to commodity specialty chemicals to nutraceutical compounds and even polymers and polymer precursors. On the other side of the fence, we can actually expand the types of inputs. And I'll showcase how we can use a variety of different waste streams, in particular, to sustainably be able to produce the molecules of interest here. So I'm going to start on the product side, start on kind of what we can make, what is possible, how we can expand biology to make new types of products. And then I'll uh, end with the inputs. So we're interested in creating flexible platforms for creating new chemicals. And one of the organisms that we have been working with since I started my lab here at UT is this organism called Uroea lipolitica. And this is a oleaginous yeast system, similar to basic baker's yeast that most people use, but have a lot of really unique traits and properties associated with it. And hopefully you will find that you fall in love with it as much as we did by the end of this talk. It has the ability and flexibility to produce large amounts of fatty acids and lipids. And I'll showcase how we can use those and harness that to make biofuels and commodity chemicals, especially oleochemicals. We can divert that acetyl-CoA and melanoid-CoA flux to the production of other molecules like uh, polyketides. And I'll showcase a little bit of this. This is the molecule triacetic acid lactone that we can produce at extraordinarily high titers that can then be used for various different chemical as well as polymer type applications. Um, I won't showcase today just because of the brevity in terms of time and topics I wanna cover, the ability to take that and convert that then into molecules like itaconic acid that can be converted then to acrylic type plastics. And finally, we can take that and convert this uh, carbon into nutraceutical compounds. So this is a molecule of riboflavin. Um, it's one of our uh, B vitamins that you can kind of see has a really nice fluorescent color when it's produced. So Uroea, as I, as I mentioned, is an interesting organism. It is a fungal type system. It has a, I think it's a unique platform for the production of oleochemicals in a sustainable manner. We can showcase that it can accept through engineering an expanded range of substrates that really allow us to access different types and forms and flavors of carbon that are all normally traditionally waste type carbon sources. And we can convert that into a variety of especially oleochemicals, um, things that are gonna be looking like hydrocarbon type molecules. So an immediate displacement to some extent of petroleum resources there. So Uroea is a fully sequenced um, oleaginous host organism. When I started, it was probably a I think you could clearly classify it as a non-conventional yeast system. It was studied by a couple of different labs. It has become much more popular, especially as we've developed a lot of the synthetic biology toolkits to be able to engineer it. Now there are lots of labs around the world utilizing Uroea lipolitica as a platform. It's quite impressive just how quickly one can engineer this host organism now, considering it was extraordinarily difficult um, when we started working in, the, in this space. And it kind of really just shows the power of new methods for engineering of biology and just how quickly it can change the landscape. So now it's still a non-conventional yeast by classification, but I'd say it's the most conventional non-conventional yeast that people can choose. 
It has advantages in that it can accumulate high amounts of fatty acids, depending on what you have in terms of your carbon nitrogen ratio. As I mentioned, it can thrive on non-conventional carbon sources, and it has this high innate flux to, and ability to produce malonyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA. However, there were a lot of challenges when we started off, especially in terms of the genetic tool sets. It's not your traditional laboratory yeast, so it was very challenging to find the genetic tools, the ability to change gene expression, to even transform this organism. Um, and it has a number of different uh, unique challenges thereof in terms of being able to do recombination as well as having plasma-based systems. So we had gone through and, and continued to develop further and further um, enhancements of these synthetic biology tool sets. We needed to develop expression cassettes. So figuring out how to have high level promoter expression, which was critical in this type of organism to be able to get the high level of pathway expression that we require within this host organism. So we developed of what we call hybrid promoter type engineering applications that have been widely used across the world and across the industry. These various different promoters um, have really changed the way in which we can engineer this host organism. We've developed improved vector design in particular, found that we can occlude the centromeric region of plasmids to boost up the copy number overall of plasmids within the system. So that's enabled more rapid gene engineering and selection strategies. We've been working on developing synthetic terminator systems that can work in tandem with these promoters so that you can have transcription occur with your promoters. And then when that transcript becomes mRNA, these terminators change and modify the end of that mRNA so that you can get higher half-life. So in concert with one another, if we can express more every time we express, we can keep that transcript living longer. We can then make more protein within the cell. We've worked on improving transformation and integration efficiencies through a number of different types of techniques, especially uh, electrotransformation. We have more recently engineered T7-based systems to enable CRISPR type applications within this host organism. And this is an area that has certainly taken off in the past couple of years, the ability to use CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR-DCAS9 type systems for both genetic engineering, as well as uh, synthetic rewiring and uh, activation and inhibition within systems. And then we've also ex greatly expanded the number of dominant markers that we can do use for genetic engineering and created piggyback transposon-based systems to be able to deliver DNA target, uh, tar cargo to our target parts of the cell. So we needed to kind of set the set the ability to do genetic engineering with this host organism. So then what do we what do we do? What do we get out of it? How can we engineer it then? So our first project. Um, was to metabolically engineer and rewire the cell to improve lipid production. So I said, this organism can naturally produce lipids. We wanted to really exploit that overproduction. So we targeted a number of different sites within the metabolism, various different form places for overexpression to allow us to reroute our citrate and, and ultimately our acetyl-CoA flux towards the production of triacylglycerides. We then wanted that product to be our final product. So we uh, had inhibitions of the beta oxidation pathway that would degrade triacylglycerides down back into uh, building blocks for the cell. And then we also needed to stop the overall TCA cycle and block that so we can funnel our glucose directly into our triglycerides. So this required, um, when we had done this work at the beginning of my, um, my time at UT, this was really the largest strain engineering effort that had been conducted within Euroia Localitica. And we needed to create 50 different strains and combinations thereof. There wasn't as much known in terms of the function of these various different targets. And we were able to then identify what combinations were critical for improving lipogenesis. And we can visualize that engineering effort here where we can start with our starting strain here on the left and we have our final strain on the right. So if we zoom in on here, this is a Nile red based staining process. So we can stain the neutral lipids and we can see within the cell, there's these little droplets, um, these bright spots on there. These are oil droplets within that starting strain. So when you grow the strain under appropriate conditions, it normally produces 10 or 15% of its dry cell weight as lipid. Our engineered cells, I don't even have to point out the bright spots on there. They're almost entirely full of triglycerides. These cells can reach up to 90% dry cell weight lipid within these systems, taking essentially taking and converting glucose and directly putting it into lipids 
the cells are also much, much larger compared to the starting point. They needed to expand the size to be able to accommodate the amount of flux that's happening towards the various different triglycerides. And also, interestingly enough, they needed to degrade part of their protein content to make room for all these lipids. So we really vastly rewired the physiology and the metabolism of the cell to be able to overproduce the lipids. That enabled us, as I mentioned, to get upwards of almost 90% of the dry cell weight of the cell as lipid the, uh, through this engineering, especially as we scaled this up from this initial strain into our engineered strain into a bioreactor type setting. And um, we have a couple of three liter bioreactors within our lab so we can test out some of the scale up of these various different processes and applications. That wasn't enough for us, so we went through directed evolution, but this time on a cell, we went through a series of selection strategies to improve our overall combination of growth and net uh, amounts of lipid that we produce, ultimately arriving at our final strain here. Kind of looks similar to the previous one, but it has um, a much higher productivity, um, as you'll see, but it's essentially wall-to-wall -wall lipid. So this is the light-based microscope. Here's the fluorescent space with the dyes, and you can see that pretty much the entire cell is a lipid droplet. So once again, reaching this 90% dry cell weight lipid, but now we're able to reach it even faster and have production in that exponential phase. We also saw an interesting phenotype with this. Once you begin to produce so much lipid within a cell, the cells begin to float to the top of the uh, culture, which is extraordinarily interesting in here in that you have these cells that even cells that have 50, 60% dry cell weight lipid are settling and flocculating just like normal yeast. Our engineered cells float to the Over. Uh, hi, you got lost. Interrupted. He's interrupted. Yeah, he's. I'm sending him a message. Okay. Yeah. Looks like uh, he's stuck somewhere. Yeah. His power and internet just shut off at his house. Oh, God, what happened? Okay. So uh, I would ask all the participants and all those who are listening to us not to turn off to wait a few minutes. Okay. Okay. I will also not message you there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am in contact with him. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. We Oh, uh, yes, uh, we put a message in there. Yeah. yeah. That's very unusual. <laughs> Open 19 time, you know. <laughs> Allow me to telephone him immediately. So I will be muted one minute. Yes, Alice and George, I called him and uh, 
Okay, here he is. <laughs> yeah, come back. <laughs> Sorry about that, lady. Internet blip. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Yeah, the minutes we're waiting for you. Get back to where I was. Oh, yes, it's here. All right, excellent. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to our internet connection down there. So as I was mentioning, we can get to these engineered cells so much that um, lipid that they actually float to the top of the culture. And you can kind of think about this as a kind of mixing a oil and vinegar type salad dressing. So we actually get this uh, floating phenotype where these cells have extraordinarily high lipid content that they can actually um, float, which is kind of an interesting feature kind of looks neat and interesting. However, except then you realize that almost every analytical technique that you would run a run on this is followed. It has the statement centrifuge the cells and, and pour off the supernatant. Of course, the supernatant here actually is the cells so that has made analytics quite a bit of a challenge here um, from time to time. Uh, nevertheless, we've been able to figure out a little bit of why, understanding what happened during this overall evolution process and selection. And through looking at both RNA-seq, genome resequencing, as well as kind of flux analysis, we've been able to identify that a lot of this rewiring comes from kind of as, as we designed, shutting down the overall TCA cycle and having this really strong funnel or push into the production of lipids. So essentially, Think about carbon flow to some extent in terms of how traffic goes in terms of um, streets and highways. If we have a really, really small street that goes down into the TCA cycle, but a really large multi multi lane highway that allows that carbon to funnel through into these overall lipids, we're going to see the vast majority of that carbon go to our product of interest. And that's essentially what we saw, revealing the importance of an imbalance that we needed between glycolysis and the TCA cycle looking at the importance of high push towards our pathway of interest. And in doing so with the genome resequencing, we've been able to identify two important regulators, this MGA2 and UGA2, that are very unique regulators and mutants thereof um, in terms of lipid synthesis. And um, these are kind of targets that have been utilized by some companies and licensed some of the technology here to be able to overproduce different types of products of interest from Euroia. So what does a cell do? If we put this into a bioreactor, it can actually produce very high overall titers and rates and yields of lipid production. We can see that the lipid production really follows the biomass production. So it's happening very much so in this exponential phase, having almost 80% almost of the theoretical conversion yield from glucose, reaching that nearly 90% dry cell weight lipid. And in our smaller scale bioreactors, getting productivities of upwards of a half a gram per liter per hour. So really starting to reach the important metrics that we'd want to see for something that becomes a bioprocess. We can then take the cell and not just produce the lipids that the cell naturally will produce, but instead create alternative fatty acids and alternative derived products. These are useful if we want to customize the profile of lipids or if we want to make unique products of interest. So as an example, we started looking at the production of cyclopropanated fatty acids. How can we take these areas of unsaturation and create a cyclopropane ring on there, which is kind of a useful trait, especially if you're thinking about using these molecules in highly oxidative type of conditions, like just fuels. If we have this cyclopropanated ring, we're going to have a higher um, net amount of stability compared to the unsaturation that's going to be subject to oxidation. So we introduced various different pathways of interest, in particular, the cyclopropanated fatty acid synthase, which uses s methionine as a cofactor here, importantly, and we can be able to convert our high production of lipid strain into something that can produce upwards of a third of the total lipid pool of cyclopropanated fatty acids. So this is kind of an, an interesting uh, step towards making an oxidative, uh, an oxidation proof type of composition. So while that was still 32% of the lipid pool, it represented a much higher fraction of the unsaturation that it existed naturally in the cell, because obviously that's the only substrate for this reaction. Likewise, we can convert fatty acids to fatty alcohols, which have a number of different applications in 
in just kind of industrial chemistry, as well as for other types of downstream uh, applications. And we've been able to import the various pathways and we kind of search through various different fatty acid alcohol reductase um, enzymes that we wanted to import into the cell, ultimately creating a, a strain that can secrete around six grams per liter of total fatty alcohols, which is one of the highest reported, especially in fungal systems. Um, still, still work to be done in terms of the overall yield in terms of amount of fatty alcohols to amount of glucose that we put in, but we can reach nice titers to be representative of process that can produce these fatty alcohols. And then finally, we can make modifications. There's a lot of interest in producing unsat polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially as it relates to nutraceutical compounds. We can take the oleic acid that's produced within the cells predominantly and introduce a, in this case, we did a bifunctional delta-12, delta-15 desaturase enzyme that can then convert that oleic acid directly into alpha-linolenic acid. And in doing so, we've gone through a number of different optimization steps uh, to produce what was at that time, and we were able to then beat that um, a year or two later, the um, highest reported titer of alpha linic oleic acid from a microorganism. So that was 1.4 grams per liter. And that represented about 30% of all the fatty acids. We, I'll showcase in a few moments how we can increase that amount to make nearly the highest amount in terms of content of ALA. And if you're keenly aware of what, of what you're eating, some of these foods are labeled that they have ALA content, especially things like peanuts and peanut butter and um, walnuts are great sources of ALA and as well as flaxseed oil. So to both increase the sustainability of these processes, but also to, I'll just show in a minute, to exploit that to produce different types of yield ratios. We wanted to see how we can move beyond just glucose, but to other carbon sources. So the first one that we looked at was this idea of being able to use xylose, an important sugar that's in lignocellulosic hydrolysis materials. It's the second most abundant sugar within overall plant material. So to do that, we introduced, well, we introduced both an isomerase-based pathway and then this oxidoreductase-based pathway. And it was the oxidoreductase pathway comprised of three different enzymes to then allow the assimilated xylose to go into xylulose 5-phosphate and then into the pentose phosphate pathway. This is the one that proved to be most efficient within Euroia. It was somewhat efficient. It was um, this pathway, especially the Zyl1, Zyl2 had limited activity, but still enough to give us growth on, on xylose. So whenever we have something that has limited activity, we want it to have more, we can go through directed evolution and adaptive evolution to improve that activity. And that's exactly what we did. We took cells that had or endowed with this Zyl1, Zyl2, went through a series of serial subculturing experiments here. So essentially feeding the cells our xylose. And as we continue to feed more and more and more um, and, and culture that over time, we can then get cells that grow better. So essentially survival of the fittest here in that regard. And we can get cells that had a improved ability to assimilate xylose by modifications to this uh, pathway in particular, xyl one xyl 2 That allowed us to use xylose now as our carbon source to produce very high titers of lipids and produce that at quite rapid rate. We then took that strain that was evolved and mated it. So essentially did strain mating with that ALA producing strain that I showcased just a couple of seconds, uh, slides ago. And now we can combine traits. So we can mix and match traits through strain mating. And we can then take a cell that has the ability to make ALA and take a cell that has the ability to grow on xylose and we can get the best of both worlds, right? We can get a cell that now can grow on both glucose and xylose and can produce ALA. And as we scale that process up, we're able to get, um, again, about 1.4 grams per liter of ALA grown on this mixture of sugars and also on xylose alone. But more importantly, this combination led us to a cell that had greater than 50% ALA content with its fatty acids. So that put this on par with the content that you see in flaxseed oil. So we really created a yeast that has extraordinary nutrition content that makes it very similar to the amount of, of ALA and flaxseed oil, which would, I think, opens the door to being able to use a strain like Euroia for animal feeds and other types of um, applications. 
So it showcased the ability to do sustainable solutions, that we can take microbial-derived oils and um, biodiesels, and we can make that from biomass and other types of alternative carbon sources. Switching gears a little bit, how can we take and exploit that same process now to create materials or to create um, other types of interesting types of polymers? And the first foray into that is the ability to recognize that these lipids are chemically active in some respects. We can actually take, and, and we've seen evidence of this in, in many times in literature, taking plants and vegetable seed oils and extracting those to make things like thermoset plastics. We wondered whether or not our Euroi oil was likewise compatible for that. Can we grow a culture of yeast, extract that out, and then make the same type of materials or even improve materials in doing so? So while we think about plant-based processes as being green because inherently the plants are green. It's not a green and sustainable process. We need to make these various different plants. We need to grow those. We com it competes with our overall land usage. Instead, we can have a fermentation that can use waste carbon and potentially convert to the same type of product of interest. So we wanted to see whether these fatty acids can be used as a feedstock for materials. So the idea is taking this Euroia strain. Now, of course, I showcased a couple of different Euroias with different types of profiles of fatty acids and lipids. And um, within our lab, we've produced over 80 different strains that have different compositions of fatty acids and, and ultimately lipids within there, from changing the level of saturation and unsaturation to changing the chain lengths to changing the overall distribution of those. And that allows us to create a suite of different strains, which from which we can then quickly extract out the lipids and oils. And we can obviously produce those into biodiesel as we've done before, but instead we can convert those into materials. And this is work in collaboration with the Carino lab at Georgia Southern University, where we provided a lot of these lipid, crude extract lipids um, and been able to create a number of different thermoset plastics. And uh, quickly and visibly, you can see differences, differences in the um, coloring of these plastics, differences in the brittleness of these plastics, and certainly the uh, mechanical traits were a function of the compositions of fatty acids that went into this overall process. And the different lipid speciations and nothing, uh, kind of lots of numbers on this chart, basically shows that there's a variety of different thermographic properties, that thermochemical mechanical properties that we can get from these materials. We can see that there's ranges in the thermal degradation rate. We can see slight ranges in the TG values. We see that that's correlated somewhat with the number of double bonds, but we've also then used machine learning to be able to find and model how this really mixture of monomers, if you think about it, because it's not a, it's not a pure monomer whatsoever. It's a mixture of, of fatty acids that are bound in different parts of the triglyceride and how that relates to the overall properties, whether it's the thermal properties and thermodegradation properties or the mechanical strength properties that we can measure with things like DMA. So ultimately we were able to show um, a variety of different unique applications. And the short answer was that our Euroia based materials behaved on par, if not sometimes better than that of materials derived from vegetable and vegetable oils and seeds oils. So really showcasing that we can make materials from our various different cells in a sustainable type of manner. We can now move on and expand to other types of chemicals. So I, I mentioned that this cell has a unique potential to produce malinocoe and astocoe. Well, that can be funneled now into other products of interest. So I showcased quite a bit, and um, we have a lot of literature on the ability to convert that into lipids. Instead, we can go in and rewire the cell in a slightly different way and produce alternative molecules. And this is going to be a discussion about production of polyketides. This molecule in particular, as I alluded to at the beginning, this molecule of triacetic acid lactone is a unique molecule of interest. It's a platform biochemical that can be converted both into sorbic acid as well as other molecules of interest and serves as a prototypical type 3 polyketide product. So we wanted to see how we can rewire that. So once again, examined both a model-based and um, kind of heuristic design type of strategy 
for figuring out how to take our glucose that ordinarily in our rewired strain goes to lipids, but instead utilize the building blocks themselves of acetyl-CoA and melanocoA to produce when we added our 2P, uh, 2PS enzyme, our synthase enzyme, to produce this molecule of tau. So we hypothesized a number of different strategies that we could take, and certainly this was a uh, really large undertaking and endeavor. It was larger than the strain engineering effort that I talked about at the beginning in terms of making the overall production of lipids, but we had the luxury of, of several years under our belt and all these synthetic tools so we can expand the combinatorial space that we can explore. So we looked at modifications to the overall TCA cycle and citric acid base pathway. This looks very similar to what we did for the lipids because it's exactly the same type of strategy of this, of this blockage of this of TCA cycle and our pull towards now instead of lipids towards our product of interest. We can look at utilizing pyruvate um, initially and bypassing the TCA cycle even further. We can also bypass this uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, it is PDH bypass pathway that we can introduce into the cell to produce our acetyl-CoA. Or we can take the lipids that are produced and go through that beta oxidation, the thing that we blocked in the production of lipids, we can expand that and be able to funnel carbon back towards acetyl-CoA. So we really took all these approaches under, um, under consideration, and there are multiple targets for genes in each and every one of these enzyme pathways. And at the end of the day, we really saw that there was a trade-off between the amount of polyketide as tau we can produce and the amount of lipid. As we produced more and more of our tau, we produced less and less lipid. So we really saw that exchange. If we can reduce the amount of lipid we produce, we can increase the amount of tau. So going back to that analogy of the highways, now we can shrink that big highway down to a small little road going to the lipids and extend, instead expand the highway going towards our polyketides. And when we gone through and, and I, I glossed over, and you can feel free to read our paper here in PNAS on this, but I glossed over a lot of the, the strain engineering efforts, but at the end of the day, we were able to get a strain that could produce about 40 grams per liter of this triacetic acid lactone. It's a very high titer of polyketides, the highest that people have reported for anything in the, really in this class. Um, and you can kind of see the interesting features as we let our bioreactor settle. Now our biomass actually settles to the bottom of the reactor since it's not full of lipids. We see this yellowish color, uh, clear color is the soluble tau. We see this murky aspect. This is actually precipitated tau. We're producing so much that it's actually crystallizing in this bioreactor. And we kind of have almost like a snow globe type of situation happening um, within that bioreactor. We then realized we can make a lot of this. Now, what can we do with it? Beyond being a starting point for chemicals, we wanted to see whether or not we can use this in a material space. So we passed this material on to one of our collaborators here at UT, um, Nate Lind, who works on polymer science. And he was able to do a O-link based modification to a commodity plastic, in this case, polyepichlorohydrin, to create a glassy amorphous type solid in doing so. We found that as we change the amount of bio-derived tap in this overall uh, mixture, we can drast vastly change the glass transition temperature of this type of material. And it kind of has some unique optical properties, as I mentioned. So we took that yellowish color and mixed it together with polyepichlorohydrin, which is really a clear type of substance, and ended up getting this um, orangish type of material. Once we realized that, we blotted it onto kind of a I just say a, a cellulose acetate filter here with its structure put on it. So you can kind of see as a unique chem uh, color. And for those who are familiar with UT and its, and its mascots, we, once we got something that was burnt orange, we immediately had to put it and shape it into the mascot of our university. So um, really goes to show that we can take something that came out of a bioreactor and use it to make something tangible that you can touch. It's a material in that regard. We have expanded this pathway into making other types of nutraceuticals. So molecules such as naringin in biosynthesis, we had to add a couple of different uh, modules to be able to do that to produce molecules of naringin and enable to us to produce over 900 milligrams per liter of naringin, which is a molecule found in things like grapefruits and other types of citrus. So we, we can also go in and beyond. We can produce other types of compounds like melanin type compounds. We've gone through engineering efforts again to make these molecules of pyomelanin, which can then uh, 
polymerize into a melanin like structure from uh, originally from homogenistic acid. And you can kind of see that we can control the overall oxidation of that process. Here we can create our melaninized product. Here we have it in soluble form. Kind of makes this interesting feature in that we have the ability to have a material now in which we can control the wetting angle properties of this material depending on the rate of polymerization, whether we have a quick or a gradual polymerization process, we can change the, as I think you can see the wetting angle here, vastly different in the cuvette, depending on how we synthesize this. Um, we can allow this material to be electrochemically active. We can enable electron transfer from organisms by adding this pyomelanin um, substance into that. We can likewise be able to see that it has unique optical properties in terms of UV properties, as well as the ability to bind various different types of metals. So we can use it as a metal absorbent uh, to some extent in there as well. So hopefully it showcased that Euroia is an interesting platform for chemical and material production, it has the ability to use those expanded substrates, has the ability to create diversified products. And we have synthetic biology toolkits we have the ability to have flexible nodes of metabolism, and we have the ability to make different types of products. And then hopefully showcase that this is sustainable in terms of making chemicals and materials. So a lot of work in terms of the downstream products, but I think it's just as important to consider where we get our carbon. And uh, tell a couple of um, short stories now on the ability to use waste type carbon sources. So our, our story here begins now in the Sargasso Sea and kind of wondering why are we all the way in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean for that. Um, but this is a, a great source of seaweed. And you can kind of see that the currents of the ocean keep this um, kind of like, it's almost like a stirred tank where you get this vast amount of, of seaweed that's there, which really supports great um, aquaculture and aquamarine life. Problem is with um, climate change and changing environments, the Sargasso Sea has also begun to expand. And we've seen now a vast expansion of what we call this new Sargasso Sea into regions where this ordinarily did not exist. And as you can see from the currents, this washes substantial amounts of this, what's called sargasm with the main, um, main type of seaweed that's in there onto the shores through the ocean and onto the shores of the beaches. And many times the beaches look like this, especially as it's beginning to see in the Caribbean and the uh, east coast of, of Mexico and even into Texas. Vast patches of this sargasm ruining these beachfront uh, areas, killing tourism, killing fish and marine life in, in doing so because it cuts off the oxygen supply. And this has become an extraordinarily large nuisance that's typically called the golden tide. So we wanted to see whether or not we can turn this environmental nuisance into a product. Can we take this sargasm waste that normally would just be hauled off and burned and millions of dollars a year are spent in many cities trying to just remove this and burn it out and take it away, but can we produce this into a product, into a molecule of biodiesel? And this would be, again, kind of using biology to do this in a sustainable, high-yield, environmentally friendly type of way. So our scheme and went in together with um, researchers at the Technological de Monterey, we've been able to develop a, a scheme where we've collected sargasm waste. This is on the Mexican coast outside the um, area of Cancun and been able to extract out alginate as a byproduct. So it's a very interesting pure product that can be used in a number of different food and cosmetic applications, and then take the residual biomass and ultimately create fatty acid methyl esters and fatty acid ethyl esters for the production of biodiesel. So an on-site source for fuel in that regard. So we worked through a number of schemes to create a pure alginate side product that has very similar overall IR traits compared to just commercial alginate and is free of contaminating metals and um, other types of, of um, contaminations that we may find in extraction. So we can get a pure stream of alginate. We found ways to pretreat this overall biomass, taking this initial sargasm powder, which doesn't have much texture associated with it. Once we just do auto hydrolysis, we can begin to see some cracks in this overall structure. And then as we begin to go through our microbial, various different microbial based degradation processes, we can see this having much more textures. We're beginning to eat away this biomass of the sargasm and releasing the subsequent sugars that exist within that. 
Um, we can then take those sugars and convert those into things like biodiesel. So we can create uh, lipids from that in a similar manner to the way that we used to be able to do that from glucose. But interestingly, we actually get higher overall content in terms of yields in doing so. So we can actually more efficiently use the sugars coming from sargasm compared to the ones that we can use from glucose, which really raises the prospect of being able to produce this waste, take this nuisance waste stream and produce it into a locally derived product, giving even more value um, to these communities. And the overall fatty acid profile that we get from the sargasm waste is very similar to what we get off of glucose, which is similar to basic soybean-based biodiesel processes. So we have a very potent way to make a locally derived fuel in that regard. Just like we can take biomass as a feedstock, we can also take other types of waste streams. So we've been working, we work together with uh, National Renewable Energy Lab try and, and Pacific Na Northwest National Lab to be able to take their process where they have hydrothermal liquefaction. This is an interesting treatment of waste where you can pretty much just take anything you have from sewage to biomass algae and put this in there with this high temperature, high pressure based process and eke out this really kind of what's called bio crude, right? It's really just an, an oil to some extent simulating what would normally happen in the environment after millions of years. But you get a substantial amount of aqueous phase, this liquid phase that has lots of inorganics in it. It's a very pretty toxic overall uh, waste stream that's being produced. What we found is that through engineering and evolution, we can actually take that waste stream with a little bit of extra hydrolysate sugars that would come from this process anyway, mix that together with our engineered uroia and be able to produce really high value added compounds. So again, looking at this triacetic acid lactone and a molecule of iconic acid as an example. And in doing so, even within these um, really ugly, messy, high solid content bioreactors, we can still get very high titers. So looking at still upward to 20 grams per liter of this molecule produced from what ordinarily would have been a waste stream that you need to chemically treat otherwise. So you can see that we can expand beyond kind of our traditional carbon from terrestrial grown biomass to things that are kind of sustainability or sustainability opportunities. So the idea of this invasive sargasm golden tide can be turned into chemicals. The idea that you can take hydrothermal liquefaction can be engineered and, and used by cells is something that I think is an interesting feat, especially given the toxicity early on that we had to overcome there. And it really showcases that metabolic engineering can aid in utilizing wastes. And perhaps, and to end on on this talk, perhaps the one of the biggest waste sources that we see on a day-to-day -day basis is that of plastic waste. And, and plastic waste is quite pervasive. We have large patches of plastic that are floating out into the ocean. You can probably walk down the street and see plastic waste pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis or, or using it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so no question, we need to be able to figure out how to deal with that, how to take the nearly 12 million tons that are produced a year and, and thrown into our various different waste streams and find ways to utilize it. Plastics really have a extraordinarily long life that they have in the environment. And we're finding more and more that the impact of microplastics even being found more recently in our blood, in our lungs and other types of locations. So we wanted to establish a plastic circular economy. How can we take post-consumer PET, break it down enzymatically to down to its subsequent monomers, things like um, ethylene glycol, terephthalic acid, and rebuild that polymer again from scratch. So we have the ability to chemically recycle, which has a lot of interesting traits that I'll talk about. And also when we do that, we have the ability to liberate these monomers, which again can be used in a microbial process to upcycle our product of interest. So we borrowed from biology. So as much as we've littered our environment, our environment and microbes have slowly found ways to be able to deal with that waste. So in 2016, there was an organism, Idionella sanchiniensis, that was identified that had a petis enzyme that began to colonize onto water um, bottles in a water bottle recycling facility in Japan. So since then, people have identified this enzyme, have worked to try to be able to improve that enzyme overall. And we came in and used a machine learning guided approach to be able to increase the activity and stability of this enzyme to create some remarkable traits at the end of the day. So this machine learning neural network based approach identified a series of different mutations, both close to and far away from the active site that 
it were predicted to improve the stability and activity of this enzyme. So we went through and made a number of different combinations of this um, predicted mutation sites. And then when we did that, our enzyme in terms of the amount of monomer that can be released far out it competes all the other enzyme variants that have ever been created to date, both from the wild type one that has very low levels to these variants that have been reported also in papers like science and nature type journals. So we have the ability to rapidly break down and depolymerize this plastic and produce the monomer, subsequent monomers. We found that our identified mutations through this model are actually portable to other scaffolds. We see that there's unique interactions that are created there and that those types of interactions can be moved to other types of cutenases and leaf compost cutenases and also improve their ability to function. So we don't just have a singular enzyme, but we have a suite of mutations that can improve the activity of pedase-like enzymes. So these esterase type enzymes that can be used to degrade PET. Our Mutations that we identify, and you can kind of see from this wild type starting scaffolds are on the top of each of these subsequent parts of this heat map, is that we've been able to increase the overall amounts of monomers that are released by doing engineering efforts. We see the shift over um, in terms of darker coloring, but we also change the temperature range as well. We can work at low temperatures and in expanded temperature ranges. And, and so really this increased thermostability and increased activity gives us a wide application space. We can have this operate at high temperatures, certainly, and be able to utilize the faster rate that could occur at high temperatures. But we also have the ability, which I think is more unique here, to operate at low temperatures, which is both an energy savings for this process, but also compatible with biology. So our fast pedase enzyme breaks down plastic at the molecular level. You can see this with both SEM and TEM type images where you begin to have this clear piece of uh, just like smooth piece of plastic and begin to create craters and holes and, and crevices within there. I think this is most impactful at the macroscopic scale, but certainly it does happen microscopically. So we went through and, and really collected plastic that was in our day-to-day -day lives. So plastic containers, plastic wrappings, everything, pretty much everything is wrapped in, in some sort of plastic. And this was one, a variety of different PET plastics we found at our local um, supermarkets. We can put each and every one of these into our solution of enzyme in the course of sometimes uh, hours. So as low as a day, day and a half, upwards of a few, uh, few days, we can degrade these plastics completely down to their subsequent monomers. We can see this process work through on this time-lapse where we actually took this big chunk of plastic. This is a um, cookie container. And as we watch this degradation process unfold, we can go from that original pristine plastic down to the monomers at the end of the process. And this is a process that took about 48 hours to complete for this cookie container plastic. We can scale this up to bottles, um, not to, I know we're running almost at the end of time, but there's a lot of issues in terms of crystallinity and impacts of that on there, but we can see that we can quickly um, melt down plastics and make them into these larger hockey puck type style pieces. And in doing so within the course of about a week and a half, we can completely degrade that water bottle um, using our enzyme-based process happening at very low temperature. So this is happening about 40, 50 degrees Celsius. We can see that that activity, especially on the water bottle, out competes all the other enzymes, even the ones that are made to have function at much higher temperatures, we can still have that happen at higher activities at a lower temperature. So really an energy savings in the overall process. And then we finally, we demonstrated a closed loop process. So here we took a piece of PET plastic. This one actually had colorants in it. So it has this green color, used our enzyme to break that down at 50 degrees Celsius. So in the course of, of a few days, we were able to break that down completely. We can just acid precipitate the terephthalic acid that we uh, liberate here and extract that away from the colorant molecules so we can get recovered TPA, rechemically polymerize that back into virgin PET. And you can see the difference between the original green piece of plastic that's here and this clear film. Here's actually the edge of it right here, but you can kind of see it's perfectly crystal clear, just like you would have um, with a normal piece of PET plastic. So the ability to take uh, mixtures of color, uh, color based PETs and break them back down and rebuild them so that they don't have their colorants in there is something that's a has been a challenge in chemical in basic chemical mechanical recycling processes where you normally get this grayish plastic because it's a mixture of everything that went in. And likewise, once we create virgin PET through this process, it has the same property traits 
as the original virgin PUT. So we don't have this degradation of function and capacity that happens in, in chemical and mechanical recycling. And then finally, we can begin to utilize this more than just a reproduction of PET, but we can actually take the take microbes that can utilize and, and secrete out this pet, uh, hydrolysate um, enzyme and then utilize the terephthalic acid and other components that are liberated. And we can begin to make different types of, in this case, renewable plastics. So here are the cells that early stage have PHA, so polyhydroxyalkanoic acids, which I know is um, a polymer near and dear to George's heart on, um, on here in terms of PHBA and PHB produ production, but we can demonstrate that we can begin to use these liberated monomers. So it opens the door to having microbes, once again, be engineered to take this plastic waste and produce anything that we want. So really this idea that machine learning can speed engineering, we have engineered this fast pedace to rapidly depolymerize PET plastics. And we showcase that plastics can obviously, once again, serve as a potent feedstock for either creation of virgin PET or into other molecules. So I'll leave with a couple of final thoughts. So I think biology really can do that chemical factory that we talked about. It can be that catalyst that goes be from this expanded inputs to our novel products. We can build biology in a modular fashion, thinking about this idea of unit operations. How do we, how do we take parts of metabolism and bring it together? We can expand and diversify what is possible from our inputs and outputs and even beat out what can be done with chemical catalysis. And likewise, I think biology has showcased um, through a number of examples that we maybe can have this closed loop process where we can produce and reuse molecules in a sustainable manner through bioprocess and metabolic engineering. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, our, our funding sources, as well as um, the students and postdocs and collaborators here that were associated with the work that I presented today. And once again, thank everyone for their attendance and look forward to a, a great interactive Q&A session. So Alice, thank you, and thank you for, for organizing this conference. And Nicholas, thank you very much for the introduction as well as um, invitation to be able to speak here. So I look forward to um, interacting with everyone now. Okay, yeah, wonderful talk. So, yeah, I saw Nicholas was <laughs> a class for you. Got yeah, big hands. Really, really great. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think we really uh, run a little bit of time because of, uh, you know, during between have uh, uh, some accident. Yeah. So <laughs> we will go to the panel discussion directly. Yeah. So we have uh, two panelists here, uh, George. Uh, Guo Qiang from Tsinghua University, a uh, very famous uh, professor uh, in the similar field. We have uh, Ze Hua Xiang was from Peking University, a uh, student. Yeah, so uh, Nicholas, we can start with uh, uh, Ze Hua. Yeah, uh, uh, Ze Hua, are you ready for all questions? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Please. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the excellent talk. I have several questions. Uh, for the first question, synthetic biology can be widely used in medicine, chemical industry, agriculture, and many other fields. However, the living systems are complex. It is difficult to design according to the predetermined objectives, and the design systems is unstable. Uh, in your opinion, how to improve the predictability of biological circuits assembled from biological components? As for the yeah. second question, uh, uh, oh, I also have another question. Okay. Mm. Uh, living okay, matter is dynamic. One by one. So I suggest you get the first one and then the second one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, wait, perfect. Yeah, that, that way I don't have to remember every single one and all the responses. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, and it's quite, um, it, it's quite a challenge, right, in the field, like you mentioned. The idea of engineering for robustness, I think, is something that people have not ordinarily looked at on things. A lot of synthetic biology, especially in metabolic engineering, has been designed for a test tube. Right? A, lot of, a lot of what we do, a lot of the genetic circuits, people kind of demonstrate at this small test tube type scale, not fully recognizing that either as we scale up or in some of the applications you just taught, just mentioned in terms of agricultural applications, these are cells that are even outside of a bioreactor setting. So I'd say a bioreactor, as challenging as that is, is a controlled system compared to what happens in the environment. So I think a lot, there's been a recognition that we need to 
look at biology in a more robust fashion. So how do we engineer for robustness? How do we assay and design for perturbations in the overall system? And I think that, that what really is required is us to be able to conduct almost, if you will, the equivalent of sensitivity analyses by looking at how circuits, designs, cells behave under both alternative conditions, but also changing conditions. And I think that that is what leads us to robust designs. And I think we're starting to see some evidence of that in the field in terms of being able to kind of appreciate the fact that you can't just engineer for a test tube. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and I also have another question. Uh, that is, living matter is dynamic in nature uh, with by mutation and selection. How to control and guide engineered genes, cells, and organisms in different environments to minimize the effect of mutation and selection of synthetic products? Yeah, so mutational drift, that's a great question, is, is always what you're working against. Right? So the, we, we have this great objective. We want to make the cell have so much of this product. I, I mentioned opening up these highways for carbon to go. That's not what the cell wants. The cell just wants to grow. It just wants to propagate. It just wants to survive. It doesn't want to make these gram per liter quantities of a compound, right? So in the engineering effort, in the evolution effort that we've kind of showcased, oftentimes we utilize growth to our advantage. So that selection, as I, as I showcased before, in terms of making high amounts of lipids, as we went through that process, we allowed the cell to see which, what would make it grow faster. So in doing so, I think we find a stable node such that there's this balance between the amount we want to produce and what the cell would be accepting of doing. Certainly, kind of think about and step back, every system that we have, even our own systems, are one point mutation away from failing. Right? If, you, if you have a point mutation in the start codon of a given gene, that could be the difference of having function or no function, right? That's the difference between cancer or no cancer, the difference between having a ton of product and having absolutely none. So, but yet we don't have that happen on a day-to-day -day basis usually, right? So there is an inherent uh, genetic robustness and stability. And if we can tap into that more in our evolutionary efforts by linking the product that we want to produce to an essential function, meaning it helps to regenerate cofactors that the cell would normally want to have, then it has a reason to not destroy the synthetic circuit that we put in. Or if we've selected in the presence of growth selections, the cell found a local maxima that it wants to stay in. And so I think those types of strategies are important for sustaining robustness of these cells. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I think, okay, George, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, how it's wonderful works. You have been now as an uh, expert in promoter engineering, and I'm so glad to see that your research is expanding from promoter engineering to a uh, uh, waste production mm -hmm. of different uh, polymer, thermal set small molecules, and then it also expand recently to fast PETAs. And this study published in Nature was actually uh, uh, a sensational here in China. So your paper was translated into Chinese. And it was spread around the community. And there are different explanations. They, people say that in the future, uh, plastic where plastic pollution will be completely solved by uh, the artificially uh, engineered uh, fast uh, PETAs. <laughs> so I also take a look. At, it was a really a very innovative study. And we now in, in China, we had a lot of problem with plastic uh, uh, pollution. And it's, it's very encouraged to, uh, to reuse the plastic or uh, encouraged to, uh, uh, to, to use uh, biodegradable plastic, such as, you know, I'm doing uh, working on PHS. Uh. Mm -hmm. The traditional PET is a uh, much larger bulk chemicals and it's been used uh, everywhere. So your innovation or using these uh, uh, fast PETAs is really a, a breakthrough, allowing very fast degradation of PET into monomer and, and, and also into uh, 
into small pieces, uh, finally into, into monomer, allowing the recycle of this monomer. So it will be uh, perhaps uh, uh, in the future, if it can be scaled up, then it will be a revolution for cleaning up the plastic pollution worldwide. Uh, so I had the question, sir. Uh, when you're uh, using artificial intelligence to uh, design these uh, fast uh, PETAs, are you based on all the now PETAs or you just uh, simply design based on uh, nothing? Just uh, say that this should be good uh, without uh, any input from the traditional PETAs. Yeah, well, thank you so much, George, for that great um, praise. It's, it's great to see that the um, the interest and attention on the paper, because I think it is, like, as you mentioned, plastic waste is an extraordinarily important problem. And I think there's going to be a variety of different solutions for that. And um, I, I, I think PETACE is hopefully, or fast PETACE in particular, is hopefully one of the solutions. Of course, PET is only part of the plastic problem. And um, we have work that's going on now in terms of trying to tackle other types of plastic waste. And, and I know plenty of people around the world are trying to tackle as well. So hopefully, we find biological solutions to be the predominant one um, for that. So we can live up to the, to the hype and expectation that we've all put into the metabolic engineering field. So in terms of the machine learning uh, neural network based approach that was used here, it did not uh, specifically, it was not specifically geared towards PETACE in particular. So the machine learning type of approach has looked at protein crystal structures and, and overall protein structure generically. And in a way, first neural networks are a little bit more challenging to figure out exactly what they're doing, but in essence, it's allowing you to do a scan of all the amino acids on the protein and figure out whether the local environment there is suitable or is something that has been seen in proteins across the entire normal protein database. And what it's fi essentially fi figuring out is what residues are not fit for a standard protein and predicting then what would be a better fit in that local environment around that kind of microenvironment within the residue, and then predicting mutations that would make that a more fit protein, which in turn means it would be more thermostable, which in turn means it could be more active. And that's essentially what this algorithm does. So it doesn't, it's not something that's anything specific to a pedase. And in fact, um, we've been able to, um, in collaboration with, with our collaborators, Andy Ellington on that one, been able to showcase the ability to move that over to other enzymes of interest, really because it looks to create improved microenvironments in the protein that can aid its stability. So once we have something that has some activity, we can certainly improve its overall activity by improving its stability and improve its thermostability as well by doing that. So I think that's where it has a generic feature to it as well, which hopefully will see itself in a variety of other protein engineering applications. Yeah, I, I think that further to this excellent uh, discovery, actually I'm asking if your artificially designed enzyme uh, method can be applied to, for example, design uh, uh, cellulose, uh, cellulases that can break down the, the cellulose much more effectively than mm -hmm. we have today. You know, most of the cellulases today are not effective. You had to uh, uh, allow a very long time degradation and you also had to use this uh, gas uh, broken uh, method, uh, this steam, uh, what, what is called steam blasting method to, to to, to let yeah 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 so you have that you have that or you have nitrogen explosion you have acid treatment you have yeah, yeah like I said a, a slew of different things that are well, sounds sounds nice and sustainable that we're using biomass it's it's not whatsoever right in terms of the kind of the the inputs that go into that process um so I think that's a great that's a great and interesting point I think the ability of this algorithm to improve the overall activity of enzymes is is sort of being proven now. And I think cellulases and other types of um, hydroly hydrolyzed enzymes are very interesting targets in that regard. We're, there's some work that's going on to try to also incorporate um, site, uh, active site modeling together with this overall machine learning algorithm. And so I think that might be an interesting for in the future to be able to both mature the net activity of the protein and then stabilize and enhance that. Right. So right now what we're aiming on is with, with the current instantiation of it 
we're aiming to say that if we are to stabilize and make a better, if you will, protein in terms of stability, we would then also see gains in the activity of the innate activity that that enzyme has. And, and so certainly that has been proven. And I think that, that goes like so far. Right? If the enzyme isn't fully adapted to its cat a catalytic mode, we can only get so much activity out of it. So I think this acting in concert by engineering active sites and this overall net uh, stability approach, which looks at distal mutations in particular, I think will be a potent combination that hopefully we'll be able to tackle those types of cellulase enzymes in the future. Yeah, I think this had a, a very bright future. Uh, looking at the successful story of fast PET, so mm -hmm. a lot of people is uh, about to jump in into this very uh, highly attractive research. And further back to your uh, this uh, fatty acid production using the yeast, uh, uh, Yalovila lipopolitica, right? And this strain producer, I remember when Greg Stephanopoulos reported a study, it, it produced uh, over 120 gram per liter, over 72 hours of fermentations. Uh. So mm -hmm. in your case, uh, you, you say it was 40 gram per liter, but the time was shorter. And I, I'm not sure if this was the a compromise between a long time fermentation or maybe this uh, trying to improve the yield. Yeah, so I think in terms of comparison, so when we had published that 40 grams per liter, that was prior to the 100 coming out, right? Um, so I think, I think there is definitely some learnings that were going in in terms of how to optimize bioreactor conditions. The um, amount of carbon that you put in obviously can change the overall net amount of um, product that you have, right? So simply a ratio in terms of the yield on there. Um, we also do a lot of our work at uh, in minimal media conditions. I think there are a lot of papers that are published um, across the board for when they calculate yield that is calculated sort of improperly to some extent in that people use complex media and glucose and then calculate the yield off of only glucose. So there's there are a lot of numbers that are, are um, around, I think, on things. And certainly at the time that that was published, it was the highest overall um, rate tighter and yield that was there. And then I think shortly after people had become interested in Euroia, a lot of research efforts across the world have been done in, in Euroia, including, um, in, including with Stephanopoulos group, as, as you mentioned, and have been able to take some of these strains, improve on them further, and be able to find uh, more optimal media conditions to improve total titers. But of course, titer is, as you said, is only one, one part of that challenge. Right. Certainly the rate and the yield is extraordinarily important, especially when you're thinking about uh, utilizing limited carbon resources or the most sustainable way or the most economical way to produce things. So just having a high concentration and tighter is not necessarily mean you have an industrial process. You need that combination, that trio of rate, tighter and yield to be able to get something that's going to be a efficient process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. So if I had still had time, Alicia. Can I have one more question? <laughs> yeah. Sure. So uh, I think, yeah, you can have uh, one more question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, hey, Hal. And also interesting in, in one of your results, you used the fatty acid, probably unsaturated one, to match some set. And this some set, I, I, I think it could be the cross linking or this unsaturated uh, bond in the fatty acid. And I write. Yes. Yeah. So this has, the cells have a combination of, it's a radical base initiation um, process. So it is off the unsaturation. And what we had in there was very, as I mentioned, various different cell types that we can produce with combinations of lipids and fatty acids. And there we found that certainly changing the unsaturated content plays a role in terms of the cross-linking and the and the traits, it wasn't just having more unsaturation, it was specific residues. So the specific ratios of 18.1 to 18.2 to 18.3, that really became important parameters in our machine learning model to then guide what the thermo degradation uh, numbers would look like for that overall thermoset. So it was a combination. It wasn't just make more unsaturation and you'll have more cross-linking, but rather it was very specific types of unsaturation that led to that. So I think that was kind of a pretty much unknown before. We knew we knew we needed unsaturation, but it was a question is, do we need more? Do we need a specific types or, or is anything going to be sufficient? And I think the answer was well, a little bit of all of the above, right? More is, is definitely helpful, but just having more unsaturation doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a better cross-linked, better type of thermoset material. 
Yeah, excellent. Let me be a, be a small question last. At last, sorry. Uh, I saw these. They uh, have a question, right? So you can get a, you know. <laughs> you, you saw this uh, fermenter. I can see that it looked like that. This fatty acids are actually uh, extra cellular instead of intracellular. I remember uh, Yarovia is making intracellular fatty acids instead of extra cellular. So, yeah, so for the fatty acid products that we produce, the lipid, uh, lipid products that we produce, those are intracellular, absolutely. Oh, the, um, I think maybe the picture that you had seen with, um, with extracellular, so tal is extracellular, naringenin is extracellular, the fatty alcohols that we produce are extracellular, those are, so fatty alcohols are secreted out of the cell. Okay. Um, we can do a quick acid, hy um, acid hydrolysis and get a floating layer of lipid essentially on there, and that's how we get our lipid product from that. Oh, understand. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. I think I learned a lot from this lecture at, at night. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank Alicia, you. sorry, I, I took too much of your time. Of course, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, many more, you know, great questions and uh, good thinking, you know, get uh, get very deep discussions. I think Professor Nicholas, uh, I must say thank you. Thank you very much. You introduced this, recommend this super speaker and this you know, super scientist to ICANN-X. I see that's the last year before his work was published on Nature. <laughs> yeah, uh, Professor Nicholas, please. Okay, so uh, Hal, I'm going to thank you for this presentation. As you know, I've been in the field for uh, 47 years, and uh, you took me back to the very early days at Purdue University in 1976, when another Chinese American by the name of George Sao, TSAO, who is now 87, 88 years old, was trying to do the first efforts of growth and at the same time biodegradation, as he was calling it at that time. Uh, you've come a long way. And I think we can see it very nicely that fundamentals in metabolic engineering and synthetic biology can lead to sustainability. And I love that. And what George said uh, is absolutely right. China is already crazy. I saw the translation of your nature paper, although I don't know Chinese very well, but I saw the translation. Several colleagues from Chengdu and one from Xi'an uh, send me messages and so on. And I think uh, you can do a great things. The next thing is what you did with PET, which was a marvelous idea. And I don't know how much uh, Nate and Linda had interfered in that or Andy Ellington, but you started with one of the most important plastics that we find out in, uh, in the beaches and so on. <laughs> The next one is polybutyl, um, uh, polybutyl terephthalate and so on. But then someday, and I hope before I die, I would like to see how you can do sustainability with polyethylene, sustainability with polypropylene. I mean, the difficult polymers that those of, who, of us who have been teaching polymers for 40 years, we say they will never degrade. And, you know, that would be it. But, I want to thank you for this talk. It, uh, I took quite a lot of uh, screenshots, and it's. Uh, I think it should be. It should be a tutorial for every student in the field to appreciate how we convergence and with bringing together strong science, you can solve really important problems. And I wish you and UT good luck with the commercialization, if you wish, of the patterns that are behind this nature paper and so on. Thank you, Alice, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. Okay, well, maybe before uh, we you know, close the discussion, I have a question for you. So I saw you have background from the chemistry, right? Chemical engineering. Yeah, yeah chemical now, engineering, yep. Yeah, you move a lot to the bio field. Yeah, you like expert in this. So you got the idea to solve this, you know, very important questions all over the world. How you get the idea? Yeah, so I think coming back to kind of as you mentioned, and, and as, as Nicholas mentioned, coming back to to our roots, our chemical engineering is a is a very broad discipline that teaches you how to look at large systems and how to 
apply fundamentals to processes. And in that regard, biology, I think, is one of the most complex uh, type of systems that you can think about. The thousands of chemical reactions that are happening simultaneously, all within a lipid bilayer that we can modify. And I think the ability to use genetic engineering to control that, we can begin to see just what's possible with, um, with biochemistry. And, and so really that's where, that's what our motivation is. How do we, how do we create new types of things with biology or how can we use biology to create those things? How do we kind of enable a bio-based solution? So we look around at the problems right, and, and try to find the best ways for which biology can solve those. Okay, so is that mainly is your self-teaching <laughs> well, we, I, I think we, we learned biology along the way, right? Certainly, um, you know, it's, we're certainly our experts, but, but um, I, I think we, we kind of dive in and, and that's kind of the interesting part is that, as you can see, we've, we've dealt with different types of, of pathways of interest, different types of organisms, even, um, I didn't mention the whole list of organisms, but the bacteria, so pseudomonas that we use for a lot of this uh, production of our pedase enzyme and some of the downstream engineering is very, very different than the fungal host organisms that we used. I didn't talk a lot about at all about some of the mammalian cell engineering that we've worked on and, and bacterial systems. So we've, it's, it's really invigorating to be able to dive in and learn on new topics, right? Building upon the, the shoulders of giants, if you will, that are in the field, learning from the biology that's there and, and what's been done and finding where there's new avenues, new types of opportunities and research. And I think that's what makes things exciting, trying to take the pieces that have been left and, and build upon that. And I think that's, that's what kind of makes it interesting. We can find a new product of interest. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we didn't, I didn't fully understand what sargasm was, right. And kind of what the implications were, but then you learn all these things about the biology on it and, and the ecology even in, in terms of things. So I think that's, um, that's, what's fascinating. You kind of dive in and, and get excited by, by the research and science. So keeps you keep, have it always having a strong appetite for something new, I think is important uh, for the field. Exactly right. That's the answer I love. Yeah. <laughs> so because many, many of the oldest, you know, listen to the ICAX talks with the young generation, young students or young, you know, faculty members. So they just started or they didn't start yet. So yeah, they couldn't always, you know, blocked by their own, you know, majors, something. They have to, you know, think out of the box, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So interdisciplinary is very important for the innovation. I think it's problem driven and uh, like you say, the diving, you know, into this, yeah, fields and then you can, you know, find out what's the best solution, no matter. It, it, yeah, what. yeah. And I think moving outside, like you said, moving outside of that domain of kind of, as you get this, as you get a PhD, a scientific degree and PhD, you're kind of getting this really, really, really narrow scope of knowledge that you've gained, but you've gained broad skill sets to understand how to, how to think about science. And as you go into areas where maybe it's not your full expertise, you actually can begin to ask those fundamental questions and ask the why, right? And normally you take, take for granted some of the things that you see in the area that you studied really well. But when you start looking at different areas, why is it that way? Or why is that the case? Or why can't we do X? And, and then you find the way to do that because you kind of almost bring this unique creativity to some extent to a field. And that's where I think it's interesting working at these interfaces of both either interface with chemical engineering or interfaces with metabolic engineering and synthetic biology and other areas. And I think that's where the exciting work really ensues. Okay, great. Yeah. I think we will take them, this message. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And uh, this is why I can't ask for, you know, get the best talks, the best, uh, you know, scientists to share the latest result and share the best thinking. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you very much for you. this opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and Alicia. Thank you, Josh. Thank you uh, yeah, Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Hal. Yeah. 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 Thank, 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 thank you. Yeah, uh, Hal, uh, Alper. I will give this certification to you as our, you know, number one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and our new, you know, session. So as we're proud of you and uh, all you, uh, you know, uh, high level work, high quality uh, speech. And this was very important for all of us. I think today you set up a new standard 
yeah, you know, <laughs> set up a new standard for the speakers. Uh, yeah, in the future, we will have uh, many, many people, you know, talk uh, like you. Okay, thank you very much. I will send this to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good yeah. day. So yeah. uh, next Hi, week, Alicia, yeah, Zola. actually we will have, have a uh, day, speakers. Yeah. yeah, Chao Yang was uh, from University of Science and Technology of China, going to talk about uh, the photonics, uh, quantum computation advantage. His group is one of the world leading, you know, uh, in this field. So we're going to have uh, Chao Yang Lu next week. And we're going to have another professor, UN, uh, from uh, University of Arizona. Yeah, he's going to talk about photonics. So, yeah, this month, yeah, the new talks, you know, start with Albert. Yeah, now we have all this young group going up. So stay with us and I can ask best. Okay, see you yeah. next week. Sure.